time somebody was killed, then the whole village would get angry and pick up their guns, and that it was killing innocent people, and that it was causing backlash against the Pakistani government as well as the U.S. government. So the leaders of Pakistan said, no, now we're really serious. Now we really want you to stop these drone strikes. And not only that, they brought it to the legislature. And they voted on it. And they voted three times. The last time they voted was just a couple of weeks ago. A unanimous vote, which is almost unheard of in Pakistan. All the different political parties unanimously said, stop the drone strikes. Well, the US government basically said, we don't care what the democratically elected officials of Pakistan say, we're going to continue these drone strikes anyway. And uh, the, the people themselves have been coming out in the streets by the hundreds of thousands. You can see in their demonstrations where they make model drones and then they burn them, as they also burn the American flag. They sit down in the middle of the highway in front of the US military uh, bases to try to block the US military. Tremendous anger about the United States. There was also a commission that the government uh, uh, created to study these drone strikes, an independent commission that just came out with its report on March 20th. So when somebody says to you, isn't this a more humane way of waging war because it doesn't kill a lot of people, or isn't this a more humane way of waging war because our soldiers are not at risk, I'd like you to refer to the report by this independent commission in Pakistan that said very clearly, this is the summary, Drone attacks are counterproductive, they cause loss of valuable lives and property, they radicalize the local population, they create support for terrorists, and they fuel anti-American sentiments, period. Stop them. So, not only is our government refusing to stop them in the case of Pakistan, but it came out in a Washington Post uh, article about 10 days ago that the CIA was seeking permission from the Obama administration to step up its attacks in Yemen, where it only had permission to do the strikes where you know who you're trying to target and not just the strikes on the basis of suspicious behavior. And lo and behold, despite the fact that they have been so unsuccessful in Pakistan, this administration gave the okay for the CIA to be carrying out the broader based drone attacks in Yemen as well. They also have been using drone attacks in uh, Somalia. And not only that, the US is positioning drones in many places around the Middle East and around Africa. And people in the region are very nervous about it. Right now, they're positioning drones that they say are for surveillance purposes. But it's very easy to take a surveillance drone and turn it into a weaponized drone. So we have been able to piece together from reports in the region that there are now US drone bases in Kuwait, in Oman, in Qatar, probably also in Saudi Arabia, which is very, very stupid, given that one of the reasons Osama bin Laden gave for attacking the United States was because we had bases in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they also have drone bases in uh, Ethiopia. US drones have been sent into Uganda and Burundi. There are drone bases in the islands of the Seychelles, in the tiny African nation of Djibouti, and most recently off the coast of Australia uh, called the Cocos Islands. Now the US isn't the only one that has drones, that makes drones, and is using drones. And that's one of the biggest problems. If you didn't care about the US killing people overseas, you should be concerned about the proliferation of drones by other countries and by non-state entities. So US produces lots of drones and sells them the number two producer of drones, and David, you can't say it, is Israel. Israel. Very good. And where have they used the drones? West Bank. Not Gaza. 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 They have killed over 800 people with drones in Gaza, and that was mostly during Operation Cast Lead when uh, Israel invaded the Gaza Strip in 2008. 
but they continue to use drones actually on a regular basis constantly for surveillance and people say you just hear the buzz of drones overhead um, but also for lethal purposes. The third uh, largest producer of drones? China. China, right. <laughs> so China is catching up very quickly to the United States and Israel producing all different kinds of drones and selling them to all kinds of countries uh, including very undemocratic countries. Uh, so there is a proliferation with over 50 countries that now have uh, drones. Well, if you weren't worried about drones proliferating overseas, you might worry about, and you weren't worried about killing foreigners with drones, you might worry about killing Americans with drones. I already gave you an example of three Americans, including a 16-year-old, who were killed by drones. And uh, I didn't tell you, though, that the majority of Americans seem to think that's just fine. Uh, when a poll was taken that said, do you think it's okay to kill terror suspects with drones, 82% of Americans said yes. And of those 82%, when asked, is it okay to kill Americans overseas with drones, 79% said yes. So um, the U.S. government until March of this year, did not even discuss this or give any justification of uh, why we are allowed to kill American citizens overseas with drones. So Eric Holder was speaking to a group of students at Northwestern University. And first he justified the use of drones anywhere and said, we are fighting an enemy that is mobile. And in this war on terror, we too have to be mobile and go anywhere they are. Well, let's remember, you know, there were Al-Qaeda people who were training here in the United States, uh, Al-Qaeda people training in Germany and all kinds of places. Um, that is saying that we can go anywhere. And then uh, he, he said, in terms of American citizens, the U.S. Constitution, unbeknownst to many of us, does not guarantee judicial process to American citizens, only due process. And so, yeah, some of you are looking like, you know, what does that mean? Well, the best response didn't come from uh, uh, Harvard Law professors. It came from the uh, TV comedian Stephen Colbert. So he had a little piece when he uh, analyzed what Eric Holder was saying. And he said, that's right. The founders weren't picky. Trial by jury, trial by fire, rock, paper, scissors, who cares? Due process just means there's a process that you do. <laughs> and in this case, the president meets with his advisor, decides who to kill, and then kills them. If we are ever going to win our never-ending war against terror, there are bound to be casualties, said Stephen Colbert, and one of them just happens to be the U.S. Constitution. So leave it to the comedians to be the truth-tellers of our day. Well, if I haven't convinced you, that drones used for lethal purposes are problematic, uh, and drones used for spying purposes can be turned against us. Uh, do you remember when the Iranians downed a spy drone from the United States? And it was downed, according to the Iranians, by hacking into the system, and they displayed it on TV for the world to see, and it certainly looked like it was in perfect shape. Like, it, it came down without a, a scratch on it. Uh, and the Iranians say they have now reproduced that drone. And they also say that they, too, have weaponized drones. Um, they, uh, we have to think of the example that we are setting. So if our government says we can go anywhere we want, spy on anyone we want, and kill people wherever we want, what does that say for other countries? What if Iran took the spy plane that it has now reproduced and sent it over here to the United States and was just spying on us? And the U.S. discovered it. Do you think that would be a grounds for maybe a war with Iran? Uh, I think so. And what if the Chinese said, you are harboring Tibetan terrorists in the United States? Or the Uyghurs who are terrorists trying to uh, kill people in China and we know where they live. In fact, they live in Flatbush section of Brooklyn. We're just going to go in with our, uh, our drones and drop a Hellfire missile on them. 
Or what if the Cubans said, we know that in Miami, there are known terrorists, self-described terrorists, like Luis Posada Cariles, who downed a commercial plane, a Cuban commercial plane. We have been trying to bring him to justice for decades, and the U.S. will not extradite him, and he lives the good life in Miami. We want to send a drone over there and kill him. So think about what it would be like and the, the world of lawlessness and chaos that we are moving towards by the example we're setting. And then think about this. What about the use of drones here at home? Well, there's two things. There's spying and there's, there's killing. So first, let's take the spying. Um, do, how many of you think that uh, drones are being used widely in the United States? Raise your hand. How many of you think drones are not being used widely in the United States? Raise your hand. Well, you're right. Drones are not being used widely in the United States right now. And there's a reason for that. And that's because we have a Federal Aviation Administration that is concerned about our safety. And they are worried about a bunch of unpiloted planes up in the sky falling down because they crash all the time, no matter what they tell you about how great this technology is. These things crash all the time. Designed to be weaponized. 
and could in the future be outfitted with what we call less than lethal systems. Those include tasers that can electrocute suspects on the ground, beanbag firing guns called stun batons. Uh, and they said, but don't worry, that we are just going to use this to go after criminals. The ACLU was not feeling reassured. They said that everything is in place for the eventual introduction of routine aerial surveillance in American life, a development that would profoundly change the character of public life in the United States. Well, that was written in December of 2011. In February of this year, the Drone Caucus took a piece of legislation written by the lobby group and pushed it through Congress. It went to President Obama's desk and on February 14th, Valentine's Day, he gave a Valentine's present to the drone industry. And this legislation says that the U.S. airways must be opened up to commercial drones by the year 2015, and before that, to government entities that want to use drones. So while you were right in saying that drones are not widely used now, people are talking about tens of thousands of drones being used in the years to come. And when you think of police stations using, police departments using these to spy, they could be big drones that are up in the air that we can't hear, we don't know they're there. They could be the little drones, the insect drones that come right in through that window. Uh, and they would be profiling. Who would they be profiling? People in the Muslim community, people in the black community, people who are dissidents, people who are in the peace movement, uh, people in the environmental movement. So we should all be very concerned about this. And one of the things we are trying to do is influence the regulations before they are written to get the Federal Aviation Administration to have public hearings around the country so people like us can go before them and talk about how are they, they going to make these regulations that not only ensure our safety, but also look out for our privacy rights. So I want to conclude before we open it up by saying that um, drones uh, are killing a lot of innocent people overseas. They are not successful. If they were successful, we would have won already in somewhere like Afghanistan, or we would have won whatever winning means. Uh, we would have won in a place like uh, Pakistan. Instead, it's just spreading the violence. And that um, this is part of a larger view in our country, whether it's the Bush administration or the Obama administration, that really has been putting so much of an emphasis on a military solution to the problem. I talk in the book about a study that was not done by some left-wing group, but by the RAND Association. And they looked at the last 40 years of groups that were called terrorist groups. And they looked at 268 entities. And they said, all right, these were once considered terrorist groups. What happened to them? And how were they, uh, how did they end? Well, 43% ended by negotiations. They were incorporated into the political system. And let's remember that Barack Obama, when he was in Kabul the other day, said that, we, that the US government was already talking to the Taliban. And whether it's this year or next year or at the end of 2004, the only way we're going to get out of this quagmire is through negotiations. The RAND uh, study also found that another 40% of terrorist groups ended by uh, good policing. And many of us said in the beginning that after 9-11, this was a job for international policing, not for making war. And then 7%, only 7% ended through military force, very rarely through military force. Military force is not the answer. It is not going to win against Al-Qaeda. It's not going to win against the Taliban. It only perpetuates the cycle of violence. So I think as we open this up into discussion, and I hope some of you will get the book because I spent a, a lot of time researching this, there is a hopeful side of this, which is that even though this program has been hidden so much, from the American people, there are people who have seen through the fog of the drones and are already active and mobilizing. And the last two chapters of the book are dedicated to looking at what people are doing. So there are fabulous people, especially from groups like Catholic workers, faith-based communities that are going out and protesting at the Air Force bases 
where the drones are being piloted, or whether the pilots are being taught, or whether the, where the drones are being tested. There's other people like in my group, Code Pink, that are going to the headquarters where the drones are being manufactured and doing protests there, and taking it a step further, going to the homes of the CEOs and doing a, a drone, a symbolic kind of drone attacks in front of their homes to simulate what it is like uh, to be the victim of a drone attack. There are students who are looking at their universities and saying, I don't want my university to be involved in research about killer drones. Yes, if the drones are going to be used for some positive purpose, that's okay. But if they're killer drones, we don't think our faculty, our students should be involved. And they're trying to sever the relations between the Defense Department and their, uh, their uh, research departments. There are also students that are saying that our universities are invested in companies that are involved in the, the production of lethal drones and we want to divest from those companies. There are people in the religious community saying this is fundamentally a moral issue. This is that, that we as religious people find it reprehensible that we think that we can play the uh, prosecutor, the, the jury, the judge, the executioner uh, and do this all remotely do this without having any risk to our, our, our own people. And that this is something that should be spoken about and debated within the churches, the synagogues, the mosques, and that we should be pushing leaders in the faith-based community to come out and take a stand, a moral stand against our warfare. So there's groups like the Fellowship of Reconciliation that are taking this on. Um, we had a, a, a gentleman from Pakistan who works with the drone victims, and he had been denied a, a visa to come to the United States because they didn't want him to tell the story. After a grassroots campaign of thousands of Code Pink supporters that pressured the State Department and the U.S. Embassy in Pakistan, we finally got his permission to come in. He came in and gave some really powerful talks in the last week, but one of the things he said is we want Americans to come to Pakistan, meet us in our capital city in Islamabad, and we will bring the drone victims from northern Waziristan to the capital to meet with you so you can hear from them firsthand. So we are organizing a delegation to go in the first week of October. It'll be just a one-week delegation, and we want a lot of people to come and join us so that you get this firsthand uh, information and could go out, whether it's again to your church or to your school or your community group, and talk from that position of uh, a powerful voice that is echoing the voices we'll hear in Pakistan. Then there are other groups, for example, in the scientific community, and they're coming together and they're saying, we want scientists to sign on and say we will not work on these weapons. And more than that, they say, we have looked into the way that other weapons were banned, like cluster bombs and landmines, and we want to uh, learn from those campaigns and have an international campaign that would result in a convention, uh, a global one through the United Nations, uh, to ban the lethal use of drones. And if we can't ban all lethal drones, at least ban a kind of drone that they see being developed that isn't yet being used. And that is what they call autonomous drones. Right now, the drones are being piloted from thousands of miles away, but there is a pilot and there is an operator who pushes that button. But the drones that are being developed right now, you don't even need anybody to operate them or push that button. They will do it on their own. They will be pre-programmed to say, this is what you are looking for. You go out and find it. Go look for the guys with the beard and the turban who's carrying a gun and is in this part of the country. And they can call in other drones to be a swarm and work together. Um, and these autonomous lethal drones uh, are what these scientists are very worried about. So they formed this group called the International Committee for Robot Arms Control, and they're trying to ban these autonomous lethal drones before they're even being used. Uh, and then finally, we had this drone summit last week where we got together and had just a really exciting strategizing campaign about what people can do. Uh, one of the things we are uh, focusing on, and if somebody could grab those sign-up sheets that's at the table right there, and maybe we could pass one, uh, one of them around on this side and one around on this side. 
is to focus particularly on the CIA and the CIA's uh, drones uh, because people in the intelligence committee really have no idea what the CIA is doing and we're trying to find allies within the intelligence committee in Congress that we can work with to try to get uh, drones out of the hands of the CIA. We have started a website called droneswatch.org where we're going to be putting up really wonderful material that came from the drone summit and uh, other kinds of videos and, and reports that you should uh, learn about. And uh, with that, I want to open it up to your questions. I hope you will sign up on the sign-up sheet. I hope you will buy a copy of the book, or as David said, buy 10 copies of the book and give them out. This is the way that our government has chosen to wage war in the 21st century. Um, the Obama administration says when U.S. lives are not at risk, it is not a war. And because it's not a war, we don't even have to go to Congress to have it discussed, much less have it discussed by the American people. We want to say we don't care who is in the White House, if it's a Democrat or Republican. We love our Constitution and we love the rule of law. And we want our government to obey the rule of law. That we have to force the secretive program into the light of day, whether it's drones killing people overseas or spying us on us here at home. And that for us, it's an issue about accountability, it's about transparency, it's about democracy, it's about the rule of law, and it's about the US Constitution.